Right, so our next job here is to create some functions that allow us to insert and retrieve items from the database. So we're going to start with users. So we're going to create a folder here called functions and then add a class, let's call it user functions. And then in that class, we're going to add two methods, one to add a user and one to retrieve all users from the database. I have pre-written these methods out, so I am going to copy and paste them. But let's start with adding a new user to the database. Alright, I'm going to copy and paste this method now, and then I will explain it. Uh, before I explain it, I just want to sort out the package references here. So as you can see, we have the method add user. We pass it three strings and one integer. The three strings being username, email address, and password, and the integer being auth level ID. We then initiate a new user object, which we call new user, and we pass it those four variables. So I'm um, quickly just adding the authentication levels to the database. As we're referencing the authentication level ID as a foreign key in the users table, we need to have those values existing in the database before we add a new user. Otherwise, when we reference a foreign key that doesn't exist, obviously when we try add that user, it's gonna fail. So I am keeping this part of the tutorial rather basic as the aim of the tutorial is not to concentrate on the entity framework or data annotations or anything like that. If you'd like me to put a tutorial together regarding the entity framework with the code first approach and data annotations, just let me know. We can even take it as far as taking it all the way to the Fluent API and do a comparison between the Fluent API and data annotations. Once we initiate the new user object, we then initiate a new instance of the database context. That being the database context that is going to allow us to access the database and the entities within the database. Once we've initiated the database context, we then step into its using block and we add the new user to the database and then save the changes to the database. The changes being that we've added a new user. Think of it like the commit command when you are writing a query within SQL Management Studio and you execute that and you want to commit the query and its changes that you're making to the database, that's pretty much the same thing it's doing here. It's committing the changes you've made. Once we've committed the changes, we then step outside of the using block and return the new user that's just been added to the database. Let's now add an interface which is going to expose the user functions that we want to expose. So let's just call it our user. So we're going to say add new item, select interface, and let's type in here our user. Let's add that to make it public. Now we want the user functions to inherit this interface. All right, now let's reference this method within the our user interface so that it can be accessed when this interface is initialized within our logic layer. All right, so there we have our first data function for users. All right, let's now add our next function, which is going to get all the users from the database. So I've also pre-written this, so I'm just going to copy and paste it. All right, I'm just going to explain it here. It's pretty straightforward. We initiate a new user list called users. We then initiate a database context object. And then what we do is we open up the context object so we can get access to the users table. And then we return all of them to list and then we allocate that to our users list and then we return it. So next we're gonna add this method to our interface. Obviously any other class that inherits this interface is going to 
expect that that class has an add user function and a get all users function. But I'm guessing if you made it this far, you understand what interfaces are and how they work. So let's just add that to our interface. And there you go. All right, so next what we're gonna do is, we're going to now expose our user functions via this interface to the logic layer. So let's go ahead and create a folder in the logic layer. Let's just call it user logic. And we're going to add a class to this folder called user logic. Now this is going to be one of the classes that we expose to the presentation layer. And then obviously what's going to happen is because the user logic is accessing the interface, which is located in the data access layer, it's essentially accessing the data access layer, which then is being exposed by the logic layer itself, which is then being exposed to the presentation layer, that being our website. So let's go ahead and start setting up the user logic class we've just created in the logic layer. So before we continue with the user logic class, I just want to make it very clear for the rest of this video. What you're now going to see is just simple code that is going to show you that what I've done with the data access layer actually works. I am not going to be using any coding standards or naming conventions. I'm throwing all of that out the window. Otherwise, this video will result in an extremely long video. And I'm pretty sure by the time you've made it this far in the video, you are very familiar with what I'm going to be doing next. This is now just to show you that what I've done with the data access layer actually works. So as far as coding standards, naming conventions, writing proper web APIs, all that type of stuff you can forget. This is now just, as I've mentioned, just to show you what I've done works. Other than that, if you'd like a video where I write a full-blown web application where we implement the same design patterns with JSON web tokens and claims and authentication and all the things like that. Give this video a like, leave some comments. You can even send me email messages personally if you'd like that and I will do a video like that. But this is not the video for that. The rest of the video is going to be pretty quick. It's just so that you can see what I've done as I've already mentioned within the data access layer actually works within a .NET Core application just to make things very, very clear. Now that we've gotten that out the way, we're going to just continue with the user logic layer. So what we're going to do now is we're going to expose the data access layer user functions. So that being the add a new user and get all user functions through the I user interface. So we're going to declare a instance of I user and then copy and paste the two functions of pre-written. Uh, excuse those functions as they are not implemented like they should be. I'm not using view models or anything like that. I'm passing back raw data in some instances where I should be actually filtering that user information before I pass it back through to the web layer. But as I've already stated previously, the rest of this video is purely now just showing how the data access layer works correctly within a three-tier design within a .NET Core application. Alright, so let's copy and paste that function. So it's very straightforward. We add the user. I then pass back the user's result. If the user ID is greater than zero, then we know that the user has been created successfully. And I return back a value of true. And if not false, or if an error occurs, I just pass back false as well. All right, the next function is very straightforward as well, where we get all users. We essentially just wait, await on that get all users function, and then we allocate that to a user list object and then pass that object back. 